Good evening and welcome to the Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute's March Science Hour. I'm Chris Bolzan, GMGI's Executive Director. Tonight you will hear from Dr. Shirley Pompani, Research Professor with the Harvard Branch Oceanographic Institute of Florida Atlantic University. Dr. Pompani will share her incredible work as both ocean explorer and aquanaut, and we are so excited to hear from her. GMGI addresses critical challenges facing our oceans, human health, and the environment through innovative scientific research and education. By bringing world-class science and transformative workforce development to Gloucester's historic waterfront, GMGI is catalyzing the regional economy. A strategy triad guides our work. Our research team, led by Dr. Andrea Bodner, our Donald G. Combs Science Director, whom you will hear from shortly, pursues a platform of advanced molecular biology and genomic technologies that is expanding our understanding of the world's oceans, accelerating discoveries that impact fisheries and human health. Our education initiative led by Dr. John Doyle prepares recent high school graduates to become trained laboratory technicians through our Gloucester Biotechnology Academy. Construction is currently underway for a new biomanufacturing learning environment, doubling the capacity of our program and enhancing our curriculum. Just yesterday, our Academy class of 2021 completed their training, and next week we'll start their industry internships in Boston, Cambridge, and on the North Shore. We are incredibly proud of them. Through our science community work, we actively promote conditions that encourage the establishment of a vibrant science community in and around Gloucester. And this includes our annual GMGI Science Forum, which will take place October 30th this year. And a second conference we will bring to Gloucester in the fall focused on innovations in science education and biomanufacturing. I have to take a moment tonight to acknowledge that next week will mark a year that we've been living in this upside down world. We had a staff meeting today via Zoom, and we took the time to recognize the significant forward momentum maintained by our team, despite every curveball that was thrown their way. It's been pretty remarkable. And we couldn't do it without the incredible support of our very dedicated board, our advisors, our community, and all of you who reach in, who reach out, tune in, donate, sustain us. The Science Hour was a product of all of this. It was an idea sparked by the COVID shutdown as a way to stay engaged, stay in touch, and uh, share our deep network of innovative scientists with our friends and supporters. It led with GMGI co-founder and board member, Dr. David Walt, who was followed by fellow board member, JC Gutierrez Ramos, two Nobel laureates, GMGI research scientists, and half a dozen other incredible minds who gave freely of their time to connect with our growing audience, and Ashley Destino, who is the talented producer behind all of it. Thank you, everyone. Tonight, I encourage you to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for any questions you have for Dr. Pomponi. Thank you all for tuning in and for continuing to share our excitement for our oceans and science education. A special thank you goes out to the 1911 Trust, managing North Shore and Boston family wealth for six generations, and the James and Gail Bacon Family Trust. I'm gonna turn the screen now over to Andrea, who will introduce Dr. Pompani. Andrea. Thanks, Chris. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Andrea Bodner, the Donald G. Combs Science Director at GMGI, and it's my absolute pleasure to be introducing tonight's Science Hour speaker, Dr. Shirley Pompani. Shirley is a research professor at the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute at Florida Atlantic University, and also the former executive director of NOAA Cooperative Institute for Ocean Exploration, Research, and Technology. Shirley completed her PhD in biological oceanography at the University of Miami in 1977 and has had a distinguished career as both an ocean explorer and a marine biologist. She's a world-renowned expert on sponges and her research is focused on sponge biology, ecology, chemistry, and cell culture. She's been particularly interested in exploring the vast repertoire of chemicals and that 
sponges use as defense mechanisms in the wild and developing these unique chemical entities into new drugs to treat human disease. Shirley is really an explorer at heart and has led numerous research expeditions throughout the world's oceans. She has made more than 300 dives in manned submersibles. And she's particularly interested in deep water habitats and is one of very few humans who has visited the Marianas Trench, uh, one of the deepest areas of known areas on Earth. In addition to her ocean exploration and research, Shirley has participated on a number of national, regional, and state organization where she'd helped to shape um, and develop priorities for ocean and coastal research. She served on the president's panel on ocean exploration, was vice chair of the National Academy Committee on Exploration of the Seas, and co-chaired the National Academy studies on, sci on ocean science priorities for the next decade. Shirley was inducted into the Women Divers Hall of Fame in 2003 for outstanding contributions to exploration and understanding of the world's oceans. Shirley is also an advocate of space exploration and tonight she's going to talk about a truly unique experience that is at the intersection of both ocean and space or exploration. And that is her participation in NASA's extreme environment mission operas, operations called NEMO. Um, this took place in the Aqu Aquarius Underwater Habitat in 2019. So I want to welcome Shirley to GMGI Science Hour, and we look forward to hearing about your underwater adventures. Thanks, Shirley. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Ashley. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Okay, good. So um, actually, I just want to start out with just one little story. And that is that tonight there was supposed to be a SpaceX launch. And I live close enough to Cape Canaveral where when the rockets go off, you can see them. And it was supposed to be at, um, I think like around now. And I thought, oh no, what am I going to do? Can I stop and like take my computer outside and have everybody else see it? But then when I checked tonight, I saw that they actually launched like during the night last night. So um, I didn't miss it after all, and I'm um, happy to be here with you um, this evening. So um, I feel really honored to be participating in uh, Science Hour. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and, and get this up and running. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so I'm going to just jump right into it and um, talk about our, the, what the NASA NEMO uh, is all about. Uh, it's, um, it's an analog mission. Uh, what that means is that it's a, a, an Earth-based setting. And so it's one of, there are, as NASA does a bunch of these analog missions. So they'll do some in the desert, they'll do some in caves, they'll do some, you know, in polar environments, kind of to simulate what, um, what astronauts, um, and space explorers might find uh, and, turn, and how to deal with those types of environments. So for, uh, for NEMO, the uh, NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, there are groups of astronauts and engineers, scientists who live in Aquarius, which is the world's only undersea research station. And it could be for up to three weeks at a time. I was only down there for um, nine days. So um, the whole idea around Aquarius is that it's kind of, think about being like on the International Space Station, for example. So it provides um, a meaningful analog for exploration. So if you were in, for example, the International Space Station and you had to do extravehicular activities or something like that, or in the not too distant future, just in a few years, if there were, um, you know, the type of a station on, on, on uh, the moon, and then eventually, of course, on Mars, how, how do people living in close quarters, um, not able to, to do everything that we're used to doing at home, how do we adapt to that? And what are some of the, the tools that we need to adapt to that? So these, um, these analog missions help um, NASA prepare astronauts for, and themselves for long duration missions. Okay, so what's Aquarius? Um, Aquarius has been around for a while actually. Um, it's, a, it's an underwater habitat. It's based um, about uh, five and a half, six miles and off of um, Key Largo, or actually Tavernier Isla Mirada in the Florida Keys. And it's, at, um, it's actually at 62 feet deep, but it sits up a little bit, the actual habitat sits up a little bit off of the bottom. So it's not quite 62 feet. Um, and it's operated now by Florida International University. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, 
But in the upper right hand side, you can see what's called the life support buoy. And that life support buoy has a cable that goes all the way down to, you know, 60 feet to Aquarius. And that provides electricity, air, air compressors, and communications, um, you know, Wi Fi, the works. I mean, we're able to get communications down in the habitat as well. And just you can see pictures of the actual habitat underwater in the lower left, and then on the right hand side, center and bottom. And the center of uh, uh, the right bottom is actually um, images of us kind of going into the habitat. And once you're in, you're in for, you know, for the duration and you, you, you know, unless there's an emergency, obviously, but you're in for the duration, you can make excursions, extravehicular activities outside of the habitat. And then at the end of the mission, then you go back up to the surface. And I'll explain all of that in more detail as we go through. So I just wanted to show you what the inside looks like. Um, so this is kind of looking towards the to, towards the back, towards the um, wet wet locker and where we would go, you know, do the dives. And the uh, person in the picture is Samantha Cristoforetti. She was a commander of our mission. You can see it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not very big, but it's not that small either. It's about nine feet in diameter, a little more than 40 feet long. But, you know, you, there's not enough, lot of, there's not a lot of space for storing things. So there's a place for everything. Everything has to stay in its place. You have to, you know, clean up after yourself. And there, everything has kind of multiple functions. Now, on the left-hand side, all of those panels that you see there are all for instrumentation that, that's used for life support in the, in the um, habitat. On the right-hand side of the screen, are, you can see what would look like, you know, kind of our kitchen area, our galley. Um, and, um, but toward where Samantha is standing was also our lab bench. And then I think I should, yes. Yeah, so I show you in the, looking in the opposite direction, you can look back and see, again, you, again, now for a point of reference on the left-hand side is the sink. And then looking all the way back, um, you can see a beautiful porthole. And that was, that's in our, you know, basically our bedroom in the bunk room where, and so at night you can open your eyes and look out and see things swimming by. And there's also a big porthole right next to the table that we, you know, kind of multifunction to use, use it for, for everything. So um, not a lot of space, but we make maximum use of the space. Okay, so let's think about this as an analog. We've got a spacecraft and we have a space suit. So the spacecraft, which is kind of like the kind of the space station, is the Aquarius underwater habitat. And I'll go through and show you a little bit more about this. But basically, these are the on the in the center panel. The center um, you can see on the left hand side of that diagram is our bunk room. There are six bunks in there, so everybody sleeps in the same area. And then that midsection in the kind of the main, the main lock, as it's called, is where we do all of our you know, dry stuff. And then the entry lock is um, where you would go to prepare to, you know, actually there's a, that's where the communication center is for communicating with the divers and with the surface. Um, that's where we kind of brush our teeth and wash our face and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, all the way over on the far right of that diagram is the um, what's called the wet porch, and that's where you suit up to make your excursions, and that's where also um, is the shower and the toilet. Okay, so so that's the kind of the spacecraft, and then the space suit. Um, if you look on the lower left, you see two images of um, aqu aquanauts in, in basically these really nifty white uh, wetsuits that we weren't allowed to keep. And, um, and then just di diver helmets. So it's a good analog for this, for spacesuits um, and, and to help NASA design spacesuits that are gonna be functional in the future. For example, right now with the spacesuits that they have, well, I'm not sure about the newest ones that they're using for the, the Dragon missions, but for um, you know, the spacesuits that we're used to seeing the astronauts in when they do the EVAs or extravehicular activities, they're not real conducive to like kneeling down. So a lot of the things that we were doing, we were kind of testing to see uh, when we did extravehicular activities, what, you know, are, are, what are the, some of the functions, some of the activities that the aquanauts would be, or the astronauts would be doing. And, you know, how, many, how often did you actually have to kneel and what, you know, what would happen if you fall over and things like that. So they use, they kind of get a feel for that, for um, 
what other functionality they need to build into designs for the new spacesuits as well. So um, just to give you an, a, a high level um, mission overview, it, this uh, MIMO 23, which happened in 2019, um, was a nine day mission. We were originally supposed to go for a little bit longer than that, but it was, it was shortened. Um, it was a shorter mission and it, it's lunar based. So just a few seconds delay. Now NEMO 22, I believe was Martian based. So it was a much longer lag time. So when we were, when the aquanauts were communicating back to the mission control at Aquarius Reef Base, they, it was like a 20 sec, 20 minute delay, I believe it was. Um, anyway, so the exploration objectives for NEMO 23 were, 23 were really tied to what were some of the knowledge gaps that, that, that NASA has and wanted to fill um, with this mission. And so from left to right in the picture on the lower right, um, I'm all the way on the left. And then Otter, um, who was one of the uh, habitat technicians, kept us alive while we were down there, made sure we didn't touch anything we weren't supposed to touch. And then Samantha Cristoforetti, who is our commander, Samantha's an, an astronaut with the European Space Agency. Next to her is Chilla Ari D'Agostino, who's a, a research professor at University of South Florida. Chilla is um, a, a psychologist and a marine scientist. And next to her is Jessica Watkins, who was an astronaut candidate at the time, but she's now an astronaut. And actually, was an, became an astronaut shortly after our mission. Tom Horn from Florida International University was the other um, habitat technician who was in there with us for the whole time. Um, in fact, he's so dedicated that his wife had a baby when he was in the habitat and he opted to be in the habitat instead of being with her when she had the baby. And then there was an alternate, an alternate. So on the far right was um, Adam Nades, who was the alternate in case one of, one of us were not able to, to go at the, at the last minute. He was trained um, the way you know, we all were. So he participated in all the training as well. Okay, so here we are in the upper left-hand corner with our nifty white um, uh, wetsuits. I never realized when I, until I looked at this just recently how much shorter I am than everybody else. Um, and then on the lower left, um, picture kind of photo op of the four, uh, four gals, the four aquanauts uh, outside when we just do dove down to get into the habitat on the first day. And then the two guys, our habitat technicians, Otter and Tom inside looking out. So that was our crew for NEMO 23. And then on the lower right, you can see us um, entering the, the habitat. So there were objectives that were both extravehicular and intravehicular activities, uh, intravehicular activities. So I'm going to go through those. I'm not going to go through everything because we had, we did a lot. So I'm just going to highlight a few things. Um, but if you have any questions afterwards, you can, um, you can ask and, or you can also email me if you have questions. Okay. So, um, I'm, you can, I'm not going to go through and read all of these. I'm going to go through a few things and I'm going to show you kind of some of the digital cue cards that we, um, we tested when we were in NEMO 23. Um, some of the tools and equipment, which were very cool, lots of, of interesting um, tools and equipment um, developed by NASA and also by the European Space Agency. Um, tools for science sampling, um, a tool carrier device, very interesting. Uh, interesting applications, because each time I was learning how to use these, I was thinking, oh, how could I use these actually in my research doing, doing field work? And then in terms of concepts of operations, how do you integrate extravehicular activities, operations with science tasks? And one of the primary goals of this in terms of concepts of operations is that for, I think, maybe even all of the missions that NASA has done so far, the, there's science that's done on each one of them, but the scientist who's designed the experiments that are, are taking place on the space station right now, they're, they're, not on this, they're not the astronauts. And so what NASA was really interested in seeing by having me down there was, I'm the scientist who designed some of the marine science um, experiments. So how would it be for me to actually be physically in that station, you know, in the habitat, and directing it from within the habitat rather than by, by mission control. 
And, um, and this was also the first time because everything's kind of also, there's a very strict schedule timetable for doing things and um, with no deviation. So if at 7.54, you're supposed to be doing task A, that's what you're, that's what you're doing. What they've allowed, they allowed us to do on, the, on this mission after probably about four or five days is do what was called flex execution. So we could take a look at the timeline and the tasks that we were supposed to be doing and start shifting things around. And, um, and that was a lot of fun actually. So um, it, it was quite different from what NASA typically does. In terms of the intravehicular activities, there were quite a few things that we, that we did. And I'm gonna go through and talk a little bit about playbook, uh, which I thought was very cool. Um, but we also, you know, when you're, when you're in space, you have to be able to take care of any medical emergencies that come up. So there were medical scenarios that, that, um, that we performed. There were exercises that we had to do. There was new equipment that we had got a chance to use, a scanning electron microscope. Um, there was augmented reality. I'm not very good at augmented reality. I'm kind of like wandering around, you know, like someone who can't see. Um, but there was augmented reality procedures. And then we also, I mentioned earlier that it's, a, it's relatively small, it's a compact um, space. And so we had tags that were on, um, you know, items that we wanted to be able to, to, to find later on, cameras, you know, you know, different kinds of equipment that we were testing. So we were testing out um, uh, location tracking devices so that we could tell where things, where things were. And, and this would be really useful on the space station because, you know, once you stow something, you might not, re you know, even if you write it down, even if you have a spreadsheet with the location of everything, you might not be able to find it again, especially if you didn't put it back where you were supposed to. Um, there were quite a few um, projects that were done by pr other principal investigators. And you'll see when I show you the um, acknowledgement slide, how many people were involved in this. I mean, it was an army of people who, um, you know, involved in conducting different types of experiments. So, um, but University of South Florida and the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition did studies um, on you know our sleep, they monitored our sleep habits, psychology. We were you know, always doing questionnaires about how we felt, how we were doing in terms of teamwork. Um, there were metabolomic studies done, uh, body composition. We had a you know kind of our fat pinched before and after the mission. Um, you know, being aware of how you interact with a team, and we had um, microbiome studies as well. So we had um, the microbiome studies were done prior to getting into the habitat during, no, we, I don't think we had to do it during the mission. No, we didn't do it during the mission. And then afterwards um, for the, um, we also did um, uh, saliva tests and blood tests. So we're, you know, using you know, saliva samples and taking saliva samples and pricking our fingers and giving blood while we were down there as well. Um, we did um, tests to determine our psychomotor skills um, both inside the habitat and outside the habitat. So, how, you know, how you can, how you can, you know, think and do some, you know, do walk and chew gum at the same time. And then one of my favorite things that I'll show you in a, maybe in the next slide, um, were some uh, other, um, uh, tests that we ran, but Draper Industries, uh, had a wearable, uh, it was called a kinematic system. So you put this little thing on and uh, actually big thing, it looked kind of like the old Polaroid cameras. And you, it could, um, you could be monitored where you are in, in the habitat. So this would be useful for the um, astronauts to be monitored wherever they are, say, in the space station. Okay, so I talked a little bit about Playbook. I really loved Playbook. Um, first of all, we were all, we, there were lots of iPads down there. There were probably, I don't know, eight or 10 iPads. Um, we each had our own iPad that we used for Playbook. And then there were some that were specific for a particular task or function or test that we were doing. And this was um, designed so that you could plan out every, I mean, literally every minute of every day for each individual. And you could work together, I talked about execution. you could um, work on, work together on moving tasks around and making sure that the one that you wanted to move around, like if I was doing something and I wanted to move it to another block of time, I had to make sure that one of my uh, crewmates wasn't using that instrument at the same time. So it would, it would really, um, you know, encourage 
uh, teamwork to, to uh, determine what your schedule was. So, um, and if we were in a time delayed environment, it would also be helpful because you could gauge where, you know, where we were, you know, we could gauge where we were in terms of our schedule as opposed to where they are back on, you know, on planet Earth, if it were um, a long time delay. So this is what it looks like. All activities of every, this was, I mean, this is what it would look like on the iPad. All activities of every crew member, every day, every minute. And so on the left-hand side, you'd see commander and then flight engineer one. I was flight engineer one, flight engineer two, three, tech one and tech two were the habitat technicians. And so I just, so there would be like, for example, this is during this period of time was when we were all engaged. I mean, when we were doing an extravehicular activity, everybody was engaged in helping the divers, the, you know, the aquanauts get ready to do an EVA. And then there would be different, you know, there would be different functions after that. So someone, one of us would be tasked with being uh, in charge of, you know, an IV activities. Somebody might, uh, you know, be tasked with um, uh, doing a test with a piece of equipment. Uh, one of us was always tasked when there was an extravehicular activity with communicating with the aquanauts. All this gray area here looks like not, is like the non-work stuff, but don't be, don't be misled because we didn't have really that much free time at all. So, you know, you see like a block of time for meal. We, we would almost always be kind of like eating our meals on the run, you know, doing something, doing something else. And then there's like pre-sleep activities. Pre-sleep activities were usually meetings. So, uh, you know, and then, but then they wanted to make sure we were in our bunks, you know, at, at 21, you know, nine o'clock at night. And then the day would start pretty early. Um, the two technicians would get up first, make sure everything was in order. And then um, we'd all, you know, stumble out of our bunks uh, shortly thereafter and get the day going. But it was, they were long, long days. Um, we had these things called cue cards, digital cue cards that were, uh, it was a program that was developed um, by the, I think by the tools team at, at, um, at NASA in, in uh, Houston. And um, it was it would it was in a uh, underwater housing, um, and it, the idea is to be able to use that one iPad and have it be like almost like a book. So you could click on something and it would show you here's what I'm doing today. Click on something else, it'll show you. Oh, I I don't know what that coral looks like. What is that? What is that coral supposed to be? Um, let me actually go back down. So for example. These are, there would be, this, this would be what the screen would look like when you opened up um, the cue cards. So there'd be mission maps, there'd be a plan for what you were supposed to be doing during that extravehicular activity. There was a marine science tab. Uh, if you had any questions about either the experiment you're supposed to be running or what something is supposed to look like. Um, uh, you know, flight rules, Incapacitated crew member was what that other one was. A European Space Station did um, a thing called LISA, which is called um, I guess Lunar. I can't remember what that's called. Escape Simulator or something. Anyway, um, the different types of equipment and how to operate that. So if you're out doing something and you forget, you know what this particular tool is for or how you're supposed to operate it, it would it would give you step by step instructions. So again, going back to, to the cues, this is what it looked like in the um, iDive tablet underwater, how you'd be holding it. And then on the, on the far left, you can see like a, like a map with a traverse plan. So that's the map of the area around the habitat. There's some checklists of the equipment that they might be you know, using during that particular dive. You can see a photo here that would have been in kind of like the science area. That was a photo of some corals and so on. Um, so, and here, and we were, we were trained, we went to um, the Johnson Space Center, which was a highlight, um, you know, where real mission control is. Um, and we had a week of training there. So we were taught how to do, you know, how to use all of the tools that we were being provided uh, and that we were supposed to be testing during the mission. Um, okay, so what would a day look like? Usually get up early, like, you know, six o'clock, 6.30, at, you know, that was probably the one time where we could actually sit down and have breakfast, although we didn't always sit down at the same time and have breakfast, kind of just on the go all the time. So 
the first thing that would happen would be getting ready to go for an extravehicular activity. So helping the, the, the two divers get, get suited up and egress, so go out of the habitat, explore the zone. So we would have a plan for each day. Uh, you know, you know, and one day we want to explore this, you know, area A and look for these particular sponges. And they'd and I'm a sponge person. So I, you know, that's a lot of the stuff that we were doing that was marine science related. In fact, probably no, not all of everything, but a lot of what we were doing was related to sponge research. And so they would say, you know, for example, I'd say, okay, go look for such and such a sponge. They could go into the cue cards, open up the, the science page and, and say, okay, this is what it looks like. But then they also had helmets um, on their, uh, sorry, cameras on their helmets, GoPro uh, uh, cameras on their helmets. So I could see what they were seeing. So if I were inside, I could see what they were seeing and I could say, yes, that's it, or no, that's not it. So identifying things, putting a tag on it. And so again, this was another really cool thing that we could use kind of to take transfer that, that idea, that concept to marine science. They had um, fairly heavy tags with numbers on them that you could put down next to that target that you wanted to go back to and then mark where, you know, mark where it is. And through this whole time, they're communicating, they can speak to whoever is on IV communications. And it turned out the first day I was on IV communications. And so talk to me, I would go, I would then talk back to, so there was all the way they communicated was either to me as you know, the IV communications person or to the dive supervisor. So dive supervisor back on shore was always the prime communicator because safety first, and we wanted to make sure if there was any any issue that the divers could communicate directly to him. But for the most part, they were communicating with me and then, and then I would communicate back with either mission control or the science team um, back on, on, on land. So then if there was a, an experiment they were gonna do, they would set up the instruments, do data collection, if there were samples that were going to be collected, they would do that and then come back into the, the habitat. The dives were typically about four hours long. There were long dives. So, and even though this happened, this was in June and the water temperature was pretty warm, you're pretty cold after four hours. So this is the station um, where uh, whoever was in charge of communicating with the divers would be would be for that four hour period and there are lots of you know there are a couple of computer screen you know monitors the um the box that Pel looks like a pelican case on the far left is all related to communications with with directly with the dive supervisor and i'm going to show you this is what it looked like for me on my first day when i had to do all of this i was scared to death um, I thought of oh, somebody from, you know, from shore is going to handle communications the first day. And then it's like, nope, you're it and you're going to do it. And when I, you know, when the whole idea was say, okay, just, just do it. What, you know, yeah, see if you can do it on your own. So on the far right is a big monitor and you'll, by now, maybe you'll, you'll recognize that there's the playbook. So it's, there's, and, and you can see a vertical line. It looks like it's maybe orange or brown. That's marching across the screen showing you where you should be at that point in time um, and on the and on the far right that monitor that's on the far right you can also see a panel that's in gray with white letters on it that's if, you, if I had any questions about something that they were supposed to be doing I could click on the hyperlink in one of those boxes and it would tell me oh this is what they're supposed to be doing if I had to give them instructions about something at the bottom of that screen on the far right is a chat page, a chat. And so you're chatting back and forth with mission control or the science team. Um, you can see an iPhone next to a, a coffee cup or tea cup in my case. And that was another way they were communicating with us. You can see I have my iPad and I'm trying to look up something because they were asking me, the aquanauts were asking me questions about a particular uh, instrument they were testing. I don't know if you can see it here, but there are there's at least one walkie-talkie there. There was lots of communication going on. There was, you know, multi. There was a lot of multitasking. I also had. You can't see it, but I also had my iPhone, and so, you know, I mean, typically I wouldn't be getting texts, personal texts, but if I needed to go and check on something, I could check on something. And then the screen that was direct, that's in the middle, 
has images of um, immediately outside, let's see, on the far left, the, um, it's a, an image from the diver, what the diver is saying. Um, actually, it, it, both divers, so you have diver one, diver two, and then um, an image of the kind of like the, the wet locker. And then on the bottom half of that screen, you can't, you know, I don't expect you to read the details, but that's where I'm logging information about the samples that are being collected. So there's a lot that's going on. And one of the favorite words that I learned while I was down there was standby, standby, because you've got mission control asking a question. You might have science asking mission control to ask me something. You've got something coming up on the screen. And my highest priority is to make sure the divers are being tended to, that they are, if they have a question, we talk to them first. So there's a lot of, standby is a very important word that I learned during that, during that mission. Okay, and this was mission control. So back on shore in uh, Tavernier, um, the mission control team was back there. So you can see, you can see the lady in the black and white striped outfit on the on the lower right. That's Evie, and she is the playbook wizard. So she, you can see, she's got playbook in front of her. So she was there to kind of answer any questions if we had, you know, questions to you know about uh, really about any any everybody in that room had a role to play. But you would, I would be, or whoever was in in, in communications that for that particular dive would just be communicating with you know, Capcom, the person who's in charge of communications, and then they would talk to somebody else. So you're not talking to a lot of different people at one time, that you talk to one person, just as they do on the space station. And then if you need to talk to somebody else, then the, the uh, Capcom would do that. And some of the tools that we used, uh, really uh, some um, uh, you know, amazing tools. I will say that the engineers who work at the Johnson Space Center are just incredible. I mean, the, the tools team is, it was, it was just so much fun working with the tools team. So we uh, had to evaluate different types of tools. What we wanted to do on this particular mission was take some core samples. A lot of the stuff that we did was um, more geology focused because, you know, when uh, the astronauts go to, you know, and I think about what the rover is doing right now, what the Mars rover is doing right now, taking like core samples, rock samples, sediments, you know, things like that. So even though we were doing biological collections, they were analogs of the types of collections that would be done, um, you know, on the moon or on, on Mars, for example. So we had, pardon my French, a badass drill. There was this core sampler and it was just, um, you know, a drill that would go right in and make a, about a about one centimeter um, core through um, dead coral. And we got permits, we had to get permits. This was in a national marine sanctuary. So there were permits that were um, requested and granted for any of the work that we did there. Um, we had to test um, different components of what they call the METS, the Modular Equipment Transportation System, which is a really fancy like wheelbarrow. And I'll show you some of the components there as well. Um, one of the things that I was, um, one of the, the projects I was doing down there was testing a small volume sampler to see if we could take really small samples of some of biological, you know, of sponges. Um, so that was, in fact, that's how I got involved in this in the first place because the person who developed this technology um, was invited to, to, to do the work in the habitat, but he wasn't a, a diver, and so I got to do it. Um, and then also we were uh, testing some uh, equipment. It was called, oh, there it is, Lunar Evacuation System Assembly, LISA, the Lunar Evacuation System Assembly. So the, the two astronauts actually did that. The, uh, Chilla and I were not involved in, in that because that's nothing we would ever do. Um, okay, so let's talk about the METs. Um, the METS um, transports equipment from one location to another. So you have to actually pull the, this wheelbarrow around and it has specialized modules. And again, here we are at um, the Johnson Space Center during training week and looking, and that's Chilla on the, the left and I'm the one with the curly frizzy hair and the teal colored shirt. Chilla is next to me. And then in the middle between Samantha and me, as, um, um, Mary, who was one of the um, tool developers. So here's the drill and the toolbox module. So in the upper right, there's a module that goes inside the METS 
and you can see how the drill fits in there. And then I'll show you what the, and then these things called sample blades in there. Um, I think that's, let me see who that is. Oh, that, that, I think that might be from a, the year before, but there's the, the um, drill. And, and on the lower right, you can see how it's you know, being used. And again, you can see they're down on their knees, which is not something typically in spacesuits that you'd be doing. And then there were these things called sample blades, which if you look at them, you can see they're syringes. So they're called sample blades. And these were, they're put in little sample depots. So you can put one, two, three, four, 50 mil syringes, um, fairly sturdy syringes. And they're, and um, the tools team, um, Adam and Mary, modified these so that we could use them to store either water samples or, well, water samples, for example. And then in one of them, they adapted a blade base. And I wanted to keep these little core samples of sponges alive for a few days to test them again. And, and we just took a mod, like a, a pill box, drilled holes in them and modified a, 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 one of the sample blades to, to a blade base to um, accommodate that. This was one of the most fun things that I got to do. Um, it was called the Draper Real-Time Performance Monitor. And this is me on the left-hand side. Here I am trying to test it out. And basically is a lunar landing scenario. And I am not of the generation that did joysticks and video games. So it was really challenging for me. But we had to guide a, um, a lunar lander to land in one little spot and we had to control altitude. And I mean, there were lots of things coming at the same time. So here I am in the habitat and um, on, you have to focus on the landing site, making sure you get over to the landing site. You see how high up you are. Um, you're modifying your pitch and your yaw. I, I have absolutely no flight training experience at all. Your fuel consumption. And then there were these little circles and just to com confound it even more, that were blue and almost blue, concentric circles. And you were supposed to be able to tell when these got, when these changed color and then kind of hit that button on the top. And I mean, I could, on land, I was abysmal. I was awful at this. In the habitat, it was my most favorite thing to do. And I, I mean, I would do it extra if I had the time to do it extra because I aced it each, each time. But you're really having to concentrate and doing a, a, do a lot of things at one time and, and it was it was really cool because I found for me that I was way more focused. Uh, we were multitasking, but I was way more focused on, on my tasks and able to complete them with, you know, even with a lot going on around me. Um, another really fun thing that we did was tested a scanning electron microscope. And for those of you who've had experience with electron microscopy, SEMs are big, usually big instruments. This was very compact and, um, and we were able to test that in the habitat. And in fact, there's one up on the space station um, right now. And um, I actually also had the opportunity to have one in my lab after um, the mission to, to test it out. Um, other things that we did kind of to test our kind of cognitive skills and motor skills were these types of you know, abstract matching and digital symbol substitution things. I didn't, I, I did okay on these, but not that great. Um, this one was another one where this was another thing we kind of had to um, um, test your dexterity. And so you had, um, let me show you what it looks like. This little tray that had pegs and you had to take the pegs out of the tray and put them in. It didn't matter which, which hole you put them in as long as you got them in a hole and you timed yourself and you had to do it with your dominant and your non-dominant hand and you had to do it. And you notice here, I have my iPhone and two walkie talkies there, two you know, radios to be communicating all the time. So you're always carrying a, something to communicate with a surface or with somebody else in their habitat and so on. And then the aquanauts, who were doing extravehicular activity had to do this at the beginning of their dive. And then four hours later when they were freezing cold, trying to move those little pegs around and then time it to say, and for you know, length of time and accuracy. We tested different exercise devices because um, there was a group um, who, uh, developing little programs to encourage astronauts to exercise um, in, you know, while they're on the space station. 
And so really, this one was really more focused to the two astronauts who were on, on board. We all had to do it. It was probably my least favorite thing to do. Um, and um, and I, I, you know, the, the astronauts are actually pretty focused on staying fit. So these types of games, I know they, they were not that thrilled about them, but they did them. And so that's the kind of feedback that, that the developers need. Okay, what do we need to do? What are some of the things you can suggest that would encourage astronauts to, to exercise frequently? Um, as I said, one of the uh, marine science objectives was to look at a new sampling technology. And the people who were involved in this were David Fries, an engineer from the Florida Institute of Human and Machine Cognition, Connor Tate, uh, his assistant, and Don Liberatore, who was on my team at Harbor Branch, Florida Atlantic University. And so the idea here was almost kind of like a biopsy sampler to be able to go in, take a very small sample of, of the sponge, and then be able to, to withdraw that sample, put it in uh, like a fixative, for example. And, uh, and the, the application of this was that so that we could, if we're doing work, say, with remotely operated vehicles underwater, and we don't want to collect an entire sample, we just need a small piece for molecular work that we could collect a small piece. So th this was um, testing a prototype. And this was the, the actual reason why I initially got involved with, with NEMO. Another objective was to look at bioerosion of coral skeletons by sponges. And we used a device that was developed uh, for, um, uh, for evaluating physiology of corals. It's called um, KISMI, the Coral in Situ Metabolism you know, uh, Analyzer, developed by Dr. Um, Dr. Zelina Smond and Rob Whitehead at University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And NASA specifically requested this instrument because this is, it's a complicated instrument to use and to do it underwater and be able to go through all of the steps that you need to go through to, to test, to measure photosynthesis and respiration rates. So what we did was, um, and the reason we're interested in this is that sponges there are some sponges that can weaken coral skeletons and what's going to happen in a more acidic ocean when these calcium carbonate skeletons uh, start to dissolve? Are they going to be uh, eroded um, more quickly or will, for example, the sponges that bioerode them also be affected as well? So we were, um, so we, we basically took measurements of photosynthesis and respiration and then we sampled, and so this is what it looked, on the left-hand side, you can see what it looks like. It was just a very soft gasket. So it's kind of like, it's called kiss me. So a little, you know, just gentle like a kiss. So you didn't damage the, um, and it's used typically on corals. So you don't damage the coral skeleton. And then you use the drill to take a core. This is a different species that has photosynthetic algae in them. And you take that core and then we were interested in, and then we took the, the cores, put them in that little pillbox module that I showed you, and then incubated them in this container. We took Kiss Me measurements of the core samples at the staging area. So just outside of the Aquarius, there was a table that was set up that had, and in fact, this is where in the beginning of the day, the divers would come down from the surface and bring all the equipment we needed that day because we couldn't store it inside the habitat. And so you would go, the aquanauts would go to that staging area in the morning, load all of the equipment into the Mets, and then kind of cart that off to the, to the, the site where, you know, where we were working. But we also used that as kind of our outdoor laboratory to do the KISME measurements at the staging area. And this is just another picture of the, of the two out, this looks like maybe Jessica and maybe Chilla um, doing the experiments. Oops, let me go back one. So I wanna just talk about the highlights for me. Um, I think Andrea said that I'm, uh, you know, I, I like all things space. I'm, a, I'm definitely a NASA groupie. And when I found out that I was gonna be in with Samantha Christopheretti, I was over the moon excited, no pun intended because she had held the record for quite a while for having the longest duration um, space mission on the International Space Station, 200 days uh, before, it was before it was broken by an American um, a NASA astronaut. Before Samantha was named as our commander, um, Ike Glover was gonna be our commander. And I'll tell you in a minute why I have his um, 
well, I had him up there. And then, of course, Jessica was a brand new astronaut at the time. She was one of, I think, 12 people selected out of 18,000 applicants for those 12 slots. Jessica and Ike, Ike's out up on the International Space Station right now, and Jessica and Ike were named as uh, the, the new cohort of um, the Artemis crew. So they will be going to the moon pretty, you know, in the next few years. And Samantha is training for, is getting ready for another space station mission in 2022. So um, I'm just, you know, totally excited that I had the opportunity to not only meet them, but to work with them as well. And then this is my, this is Don Liberatore with me in the upper, Don's my husband, but he was also on uh, our, our field team uh, back at the, back at the space, at the um, Aquarius base. But getting to dive in the neutral buoyancy facility, that's where sometimes you'll see the NASA astronauts being lowered into water and there's a, a mock-up of the space station in there. And that's where they actually train on how to work, do extravehicular activity around the, um, the space station. And this is where we had to take our swim test. We had to do a swim test before we could um, be uh, allowed to, to be a, an aquanaut. Um, so that was a huge highlight. The pool is 100 feet wide by 200 feet long and 40 feet deep. And when I was at the Johnson Space Center, I got to go to the actual mission control, which was totally cool. And so you could see a lot of stuff that was going on on the um, International Space Station at the time. So it was for me, you know, again, as, an, as a NASA groupie, I was like just totally excited about all of this. The other thing really um, uh, cool thing that we were able to do when we were in the habitat was NASA arranged for us to have a private meeting with uh, astronauts that were on the International Space Station. So we were all kind of gathered around a computer monitor and talking to the astronauts on the space station. They were showing, they gave us a tour of the space station. We gave them the tour of the Aquarius and we talked about the different things we were doing. Really a thrill of a lifetime for sure. Okay, so I'm gonna um, give you some, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna anticipate some questions that you're gonna ask me. So I'm gonna answer those right now. First of all, where's, where's the bathroom? So if you look on the lower right, where it says the fish are watching, that's where the bathroom is. It's separated from everything by a, like a shower curtain. That's also where the shower is. So when you take a shower, the toilet gets wet. We were lucky because in, you know, up until just recently, if you had to go to the bathroom, you had to go out and into this like little gazebo, pop your head up and there was airspace in there and that's where you went to the bathroom. So, uh, in fact, there was a possibility that we weren't going to get the toilet installed because the habitat had, had undergone some renovations. And um, the, we four um, female aquanauts basically said we were not going down until they put a toilet in. So, um, anyway, so we got the toilet. Um, and during decompression, that entry lock is sealed off and from the wet porch. And so if you have to use the bathroom during the 18 hours that we're decompressing, you do, you use it, there's a little uh, commode in the entry lock. There's an all purpose sink that's across from the, uh, the you know, where the, the uh, decompression commode is. Um, and that's where you, you know, kind of brush your teeth, wash your face. There are cameras everywhere. The only place there's not, there's no camera in the bunk room and there's no camera that, there's a camera on the wet porch, but it doesn't go, you, you know, like you can go into the, the toilet and take a shower uh, without somebody watching you, but there are cameras everywhere. So, um, you know, somebody's watching you all the time. Where did we sleep? Okay, so there's a bunk room with six bunks, three on each side, um, where the, the computer is. And Tom's working on one of our cognition ex um, exercises. That was my bunk. What did we eat? We ate Mountain House dried foods, freeze dried foods. They were pretty good. They were actually pretty good. Uh, but every now and then we would get goodies from shore. So every day there were divers who came down to bring us supplies or things like that. And so one time we got like a key lime pie, one time we got a lemon meringue pie, we had pizza day that they brought down. And I'm gonna tell you in a minute how, that, how we were able to do that. So we had treats, but typically you couldn't keep like fruit or bread or stuff in that, you know, that under, you know, under that part, it just goes, it goes bad right away. Um, but the food was not bad. 
Um, could we talk to our family and friends? Yep. Uh, text, email, phone calls, the work. So during our quote unquote free time was when we would be able to, to talk to them. And because anybody could watch from this view on the camera. So, um, you know, my family could see what I, you know, what I was doing if I were in that room. So, you know, my family and the rest of the world could see what we were doing. How did you get things down to the Aquarius without getting them wet? Okay, there, first of all, you pack them um, and, and vacuum seal them in bags. And then you put them into these pots that look like pressure cookers and seal those and take those down. They are under pressure. Once you get them in the habitat, you, you vent them and then things stay dry, you take them out. And that's how we got like the pizza and how we got lemon meringue pie and key lime pie and stuff, candy, stuff like that. And then similarly, at the end of the, the mission, if you wanted, to, like when we wanted to bring like this at the scanning electron microscope, it went in one of these pots. So anything, you know, our clothes, our, you know, phones, computers, everything went into the pots. Did you have to decompress? Yes. So Aquarius is at the ambient pressure at that depth. So it's two and a half times the surface pressure. So at the end of the mission, we decompress for 18 hours inside Aquarius, but on the bottom. So Aquarius doesn't come up and down, it's fixed. And, um, and we had to just breathe um, pure oxygen intermittently for about the first hour. And then after that, we could get up and you know walk around. So it was about 18 hours and it started at night. So six o'clock at night. So most of the time we were sleeping. And then after we go through that, and so you're gradually coming, you know, getting the, to the pressure of, the, of sur the surface pressure. And that takes you about 18 hours. And then at the end of that period of time, you're at quote unquote, the surface. I mean, we're still, you know, at 62 feet in the habitat, but it's at surface pressure. And then, then we put on our, you know, our swimsuits, our you know, get ready to, 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 to go back up to the surface because then the habitat is pressurized back down to 60 feet. And then we, we go out, we put on our tanks and we swim to the surface and there's a, a boat there. And actually there were divers from the surface, divers who came out and accompanied each one of us to make sure we, we were okay. Um, and th these were the, the folks who really, um, you know, ran the whole mission. So um, really an incredibly talented team um, worked together, you know, worked really hard for this. And the two people on the lower right, um, Mary Walker and Adam Nades were the, the tools team. And so they weren't, they, by the end, this picture on the left was taken at the end of the mission. And by then Mary and Adam were deployed to do something else. So they weren't there for the group photo at the end. And I'm not gonna go through this list. I just want you to see, it takes a village. There were lots and lots of people. There were lots of contractors involved. There were lots of other principal investigators who uh, were involved as well. And there we are all together. This was my team, um, my, the sponge girls from Harbor Branch, my husband on the, the lower right, who really took care of everything at the end of the day, downloaded all of the data from the Kiss Me units, fixed the, you know, the sampling devices, made sure they were all ready for the next day. So they were working all day while we were on, you know, communicating with us, communicating through the science team, and then at night would download data, fix everything and get it ready for the next morning. Oh, real quickly, dive the Mariana Trench. I just, this is my bucket list. I just want to correct something. I did not actually go to the bottom of the Mariana Trench. I was on a mission where we had an ROV that went to the, 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 the Mariana Trench. So check, that's done. Dive under the ice in Antarctica. Arctica, oh, I'm, I spelled that wrong. Um, you, I mean, a long time ago when I was younger, I wanted to do that, but it's too cold. I'm too cold. I, I, I like diving in warm water. Uh, do an Aquarius mission, check. I wanna see the Grand Canyon. I've never been to the Grand Canyon, so maybe next year. Okay, any questions? Thanks so much for your interest. And I hope I've left a little bit of time for questions. Thank you, Shirley, that was amazing. What a really unique experience. Um, we, we have time maybe just for a couple questions. It was great that you actually uh, answered many of our questions at the end of your talk as well. Um, so let's uh, start off with, uh, if you had the chance, would you go to outer space? You know, somebody asked me that question. I gave this talk a, a couple months ago. So um, if I can be 
teleported up there. I think I would like have a heart attack on take on, on the launch. But if I could be teleported up there, yes. But I, the other thing is I have this intense fear of heights. So for me to actually go to the top of a rocket and sit up there, I'd be in panic. But now that I've been thinking about it more, it would be totally cool to be on the space station. So I would love to do that, but I don't think I'd ever make it through the launch. Great. Um, can you discuss um, the, impact, uh, the impact of ocean acidification that you saw? So, um, it, you know, right now out on the reef, we're, it's what we've been seeing out on the reef, in fact, Otter and I, who are both around the same age and have been diving on the reefs for a long time, decades, we're just so depressed because it's kind of, everything's kind of, you know, on that particular reef, not really in good shape. And it's been cumulative and it's not just climate change, it's development, it's, you know, sedimentation from, from you know shoreline development, its impacts of like kind of uh, uh, you know cold water or fresh water coming in. Um, so that's what we've seen so so far, and um, you know I, I can't actually relate it specifically to climate change at this point. Okay, you talked a little bit about the decompression protocol. So this question is a little bit related to that. When you came back to the surface, did you find that there, you were more winded doing normal activities or was there any effect when you came back to the surface? Um, I was definitely tired for a few days and um, I was definitely tired. It was, it was, I would say for probably about three or four days afterwards, I was, I was really tired. But other than that, no. Uh, the Nemo expedition sent terrestrial humans underwater. Um, can you comment on aquatic animals that have gone into space? Uh, no, I can't. I, you know what? I'm just going to give this quite the simple answer. No, because I, I always tell my students, if you know, don't know the answer to that question, just say, I, I, I can't. I can't comment <laughs> on it. I don't, I don't know which aquatic animals have gone into, into space. But my uh, colleague and I were just talking about this today, about sending sponge, doing some experiments with sponges in space. Um, have, have you heard if any of the of what was tested on Nemo twenty three has been successfully used in space? Uh, uh, well, the the SEM the scanning electron microscope has been it's it's on the space station, so I know that has been, and I'm not sure if any of the um, I don't know if they've used the little um, you know devices to tr the tracking devices or not playbook for sure is being used so the scheduler is being used and I found that extremely helpful so that one's being used um, can did it was anything interesting revealed about the microbiome studies of all of the astronauts? so we yeah so we we got our data back and um, so there were definitely some changes that occurred while we were while we were in the habitat. And I will tell you that for me, and, and well, the, the mountain house foods that we ate were really high in sodium. And I thought, oh my God, this is gonna be awful. My cholesterol level dropped probably about 30 points in the nine days I was down there. So it was, you know, yeah, there was, I, you know, and as I think I mentioned, I was really focused. I was very kind of, you know, task oriented and quite focused as well. I felt, I felt, Good. Okay, um, this is one about the relationship between corals and sponges. Um, and you had made a comment about uh, sponges eroding corals. Are, are the sponges actually pests for coral reefs or do they have a symbiotic relationship with other aspects of the ecosystem? Oh, um, so these, the sponges that I showed are ones that actually bio bore into the coral. So it's more of a, you know, like habitat, you know, habitat. So, they're more um, beneficial aspects of sponges. So they're a part of that ecosystem. And in fact, in the Florida coral reef, sponges are key components. And in fact, it's been uh, hypothesized that maybe, because sponges do are doing really well with the higher temperatures that we're experiencing now, and the coral reefs may have a phase shift to sponge reefs in the future. Yeah, I know. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Shirley. Uh, we're a little bit over time, so I think we're going to wrap things up, and I'm going to quickly turn things over to Chris just to, to say goodnight to everyone, but I really want to thank you very much for participating in our Science Hour. It's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. My pleasure.
Yes, thank you so much, Shirley and Andrea, for sharing your time and your work, your stories with us tonight. That was awesome. Very different than a lot of the other talks we've had, and I think really showcasing another type of fascinating science our network is producing. So really grateful for this opportunity. Thank you again to the 1911 Trust and to the James and Gail Bacon Family Trust for sponsorship and to everyone out there for joining in and continuing to support GMGI's mission. We look forward to throwing open the doors of the Institute and the Academy for visits, for some wine and cheese, and for gathering in person. Please stay tuned, stay in touch. I would love to hear from you. We have two more amazing science innovators lined up for April and May. I'm going to share those dates and those names on a brief slide with you now. Good night, everyone, and I'll see you next month.